I don't have a particularly loud voice, but I do. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what I, what, the other thing I realized is the more I read about color, the more I realize I don't know enough or much. But you have to draw the line somewhere. So um, what I, when Robin called I, or emailed, and I thought, geez, it's such a huge field. So I kind of narrowed it down to basic topic, topics that we talk about in our color class. And, um, and also, because you guys are interested in art and printmaking, and my students are design majors who want the quick fix. So a little bit different slant. So um, as I was talking to someone before the lecture, there are hundreds of different color systems out there. And even going back to Aristotle, they talked about color systems. Um, and some debate about what the primary colors were, if there were primary colors. And you guys probably all remember in grade school, you learned that red, yellow, and blue are the primary colors. And you were mixing your temper paints, and they were supposed to make black. And they never did. So <laughs> we were totally baffled at the age of seven. So I always include these because these are just fascinating to me. These are older color systems. Most, uh, I think they go back to about 1400, 1500, and um, on up into the res Renaissance. But what I find intriguing about them, first of all, they're always in black and white. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand that. And I really, some of them I don't understand at all. Like these up here, um, early color systems were, uh, or ideas about color were based on ideas about the pigments or the mineral or organic material that generated that color and what the significance of, say, lapis lazuli or malachite was. And um, the purity of the color was really important, so there was no color mixing. I had to flesh more of them. The, these, these are a little bit newer, going up into uh, 1912, I can't, even I can't read the dates, but I can't remember. Uh, Paul Clay, 1924. Um, so early color systems or ideas about color really were all about the purity of the color and not mixing. And uh, even when we look at some of these uh, Fayum portraits, and this one's from Roman era, which is encaustic, and all my, almost all my images are paintings because it's easier to find examples. And I got a lot of images off of Art Store, which is an online database for me at KU. It's free, but you can subscribe to it. It has wonderful images, and it is a little weak on contemporary. And then I had to download a few things off the internet, and you'll know them because they're really pixelated. Anyway, um, you see a lot of flesh tones in here, but what is happening, because they're so interested in the purity of the color, that they're not mixing it, but they're making this cross-hatching or hatching of marks, brush strokes, and that layer of pure pigment next to another pigment is building up the colors that you're seeing. Um, that was also true in Fresco, uh, Raphael School of Athens, and also in Egg Tempera which I forgot to put one in. But they're using pure pigment and the yolk of an egg. It dries extremely fast, a matter of seconds. So you really can't mix it much at all, even if you tried. So it's that layering of color that is creating the depth and uh, some of the uh, browns and greens and whatever. Interesting. And they do stick with red, blue, and yellow a lot. Um, and then in the Renaissance, uh, oil painting was invented, and what it allowed for was that kind of mixing of pigments, and not just on the palette, but also on the painting. Um, still, this is Jan of uh, Nike's, I don't have the name of it here. Um, but they did a lot of glazing, really thin, translucent layers of paint to build up those colors. Uh, also Leonardo, and you, if you remember the Da Vinci Code, this is the first painting that comes in. And the other thing that was invented during the Renaissance is linear perspective. And so artists are starting to pay attention to how space is being developed. And you can see it a little bit back in here. This is one of the darker images I've seen of this particular painting. Um, and as colors go back in space, 
if you're looking out the window and you look you know, at that landscape, as they go back in space, they get lighter in value and they also get greater because they're inter interacting with the atmosphere. So artists are starting to replicate this. Um, so really the no, uh, no color research or cohesive theory was developed until uh, Isaac Newton wrote his book on optics in 1607. And he published what was actually a, a common idea at the time is that white light contains all colors of the visible spectrum. And he put the white light here, which is light from the sun, through a prism and it broke up into the colors of the visible spectrum. He also projected that back through the prism and they coalesced into white light. Um, <coughs> Newton created the first color wheel, which is kind of ironic because he, all he's talking about is physics here. And uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'll show you here in a minute, that it's linear. Our range of vision is going from um, ultraviolet to infrared. And there's really no correlation between this color and this color on the visible spectrum. But oddly <coughs> enough, he made this color wheel and it works for us as artists that we can mix red and blue and get purple. Um, but the other thing that's kind of intriguing about Newton's color wheel is that he decided that there were seven colors on the color wheel. And I've heard a lot of different things about it. First he decided there'd be five, and then he decided there'd be seven. And some people say, well, it was more aesthetic. There were seven known planets at the time. There was also the real interest in correlating uh, color and music. And since there were seven notes in an octave, that put seven colors in. And on his color wheel, you see each piece of the pie is different in size because Newton thought that red and blue and yellow occupied more space on the visible spectrum. Not necessarily true, but an interesting color wheel. And really, what he did was initiate this whole idea about additive color mixing, which is light interacting with light. And in the additive color wheel, which really didn't pertain to artists or designers in the 1600s, um, the primary colors are red, green, and blue. And these are the things we see on our monitors now, or on your digital devices, but until the past 20 or 30 years, it really had no correlation to what we're doing in the art world at all. Um, but in additive mixing, which is TVs, digital cameras, your computer monitor. The primary colors of red and blue make magenta. Blue and green make cyan. And then red and green make yellow. And if you took physics back in high school or college, you're familiar with that. But my husband, who's an artist, said, no, that's not true. So, and I always have to think, you know, well, we're starting at the basics, so no one has to ask the dumb question. So um, in additive mixing, if you mix all the colors, you get white or white light. The black is the result of no light. Uh, we always have a little bit of black or a little bit of light in there because of ambient light. Um, so really, additive mixing is light interacting with light. And here you see the visible spectrum going from gamma rays down to radio <coughs> waves. And here's human color vision. Really very small part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Now we get to the fun part. Uh, so it sounds pretty technical, doesn't it? But um, obviously something I downloaded off the internet because highly pixelated. I'm going to move over here so I can see. Um, so here's your eye. And uh, as light comes in and goes through the lens right here and the pupil, there's muscles around that contract and control the amount of light in. And um, most of that goes right back here to the fovea. And in our eye, this is the retina back in here, and the optic nerve. So on the retina, there's photosensitive cells that process that information. And most of them are right there in the fovea where we um, get our best vision. And on the retina, there are some uh, rods, which are 
and they're around the edge here. And they function in low, low light. And since mammals were basically nocturnal, we have a lot more rods than anything else. About 100 million rods in our eyes. And they function in low light, and they don't process color. Um, <coughs> on the back here is where the cones are. And the cones, they're not as many. I, have to, I had to write this down because after all these years of teaching color, I can't remember. Six million <coughs> cones, and uh, they are what process the color. They don't function well in low light at all. And so most of them are right back here in the phobia, and most of those cones are red and green. So we get red, green, and yellow really well uh, visual perception. There are some blue cones, and we have three cone types, red, green, and blue, just like additive color mixing. There are some blue cones that are interspersed with the rods. So as light levels fall, and we're switching to our rod vision, and a little bit more peripheral vision, because that's where those rods are located, you can still see a little bit of blue. Um, and red is the first color that disappears at low light levels, because mainly it's back down on the phobia. Um, get my control straight. Uh, well, back here for a minute. Um, there are some problems in color vision that can result from structures in your eye. That there may be defective cones, and usually those are red and green because that's a newer cone. Old world primates and humans are the only ones that, of the mammals that have three cone types. Uh, the rest of the mammals just have blue and yellow or what passes it yellow. Um, and then I forgot what I was going to say, so I guess we'll go on. It happens all the time. Um, but once that information is in the cones, uh, the, inf the retina also processes it a little bit more and then it's sent to the brain for uh, interpretation. So color vision, or vision in general, is really more than just your eye. It's a, it's a process that involves also your brain. And you can have problems with your brain that will affect your vision even though your eyes are working perfectly. So, um, who knows? Um, so this is human color vision. And we have our older blue cone here, which functions at about 400 to say 500 nanometers. Uh, we talk about light waves and nanometers. Uh, Light also functions as particles, but we never talked about that in color. And here we have the red and green cones, which are quite, the range is pretty similar. And these are thought to be the newer cones. And so we, if you look at other mammal vision, theirs is the predecessor for these two cones. And because they're newer cones, that's where a lot of the genetic mutation will come up as far as color vision problems with red and green cones. And you all have heard people who are colorblind, and it's usually red and green. Very rarely is it blue, and even more rarely is it completely colorblind, which is also a genetic mutation with cones. Um, and it's also carried on the X chromosome, which is for women. So uh, that is a recessive trait. So you could be, as a woman, you could be a carrier for that red, green, colorblind deficiency um, and not know it and then pass it on to your son who would be red, green, colorblind. Um, there's also some research that suggests there's a fourth cone type, uh, which is kind of like this one, a little bit farther out. It's a red cone and it's also only in women. So there, there you have it. I'm superior once again. Um, yeah. Uh, so I have the, I just get so intrigued by these uh, ideas about cones. And here we are at the top. Um, here's what bees see. They don't really see red, but what they can see is ultraviolet. And then um, birds have four cone types. And so it's really hard for us to even imagine what birds and bees see because it's outside of our range of vision. Um, and then I've heard of, um, some reptiles can see ultraviolet, some can see infrared, and then one of my students who was a biology major came in and told me that scorpions actually have retinal cells, not just in their eyes, but on their abdomens. And, and they're just, we're all just creeped out. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fine. 
So being a, cut, a cat person, I always have to stick in my little blip about cat color vision. But this is pretty typical about all mammals, that dogs also, horses, whatever. That here we are over on the left, this is our range. Cat vision, because they really just have the two cones, blue and yellow, they're seeing um, a much narrower range of colors or gamut of colors. And even though my cat's favorite toy was a pink male, she can't see pink. What she really liked was the long tail that was hanging from it. Or you think about matadors that are waving the red cape. The bulls can't see the red in the cape. What they're responding to is the action of the cape itself. Um, and then this is, the far right is no color vision at all. And there's a very small part of the population that absolutely has no color vision. And there's an island in the South Pacific um, if, if you're familiar you're with Oliver Sacks, a neurologist, he wrote a book called The Anthropologist on Mars. And then he also wrote a book, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's all about this island in the South Pacific because of um, problems during World War II and genetic in, uh, inbreeding that they have probably 17% of their population is completely colorblind and because they don't have any functioning cones in their retina, uh, they also can't see well in bright light and are somewhat nearsighted. So they, when Oliver Sacks went there, he took prescription sunglasses and everybody was uh, quite happy. There's actually a video on YouTube about it. It's really fascinating. Well, and Margie, I want to chime in here that Linda Hall Library is doing a series of programs around color this fall, and a week and a half ago, for the first time, they're now live streaming it, and you can go on the Linda Hall Library site and see the presentation. The gentleman they brought in would, had no color vision, and he has this little implant uh, in his head where he uses sound to tell him what color is around him. And the technology that he's exploring is fascinating, if that's of interest to anyone. Mm -hmm. There are some tests, um, there's some documentation that people who are blind can sense color, and I'm not quite sure how that works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are special glasses that people who are colorblind can be fitted for, and sometimes it works and yeah, sometimes it doesn't. So there's this whole realm of uh, things that are happening within color, particularly the scientific aspect. Um, okay, so the other type of color mixing is subtractive mixing, and that's what we use most of the time. And basically here, the white light is interacting with the surface. There's pigments in that surface that are either absorbing or reflecting some of those light waves and depending on what's reflected, that's what we see. So it's subtracted. So you see the top one, you like an apple, white light that contains all colors of the visible spectrum, hits the apple, most of those light waves are absorbed, but the red light waves are reflected. And that's why we see red, or the center one, a lime, and then the bottom one is uh, blue. So because white light also contains heat, that some of this, if you think about it logically, it will make sense to you, that white light contains all the colors of the visible spectrum. You're outside on a hot day and you're wearing white. All those light waves are reflecting off the surface and also bouncing that heat off your clothing. Whereas if you're wearing black, and this bottom image is supposed to be black, it doesn't really look black to me, but maybe it does too. Um, all those light waves are absorbed. Since light also carries heat, you just get a lot hotter when you're wearing black in the summer. And we see this in painting, printmaking, um, your computer prints, anytime light is inter interacting with the surface. And in theater spotlights, with the spotlights themselves, they're using additive mixing, the, the interaction of red, green, and blue. But then it hits whatever's on the stage, and then you have this combination. So most of the time we just think about subtractive mixing, and really that's what pertained to artists for a long time until we invented computer technology and just confused everyone.
So for uh, subtractive mixing, we actually have two prime uh, color wheels. And one is the pigment wheel, which is what we all grew up on, and basically three primaries, yellow, red, and blue, um, intermediates of violet, orange, and green, and then whatever those third ones are. Because we never go into that in color theory. We just deal with uh, our colors. But more recently, we have the process wheel, which is cyan, magenta, and yellow. And we call it the process wheel because when you have something that you're sending to a commercial printer, they're going to print it in press runs of one complete run is cyan, one complete one is magenta, and one is yellow. And it may vary in order. And theoretically, with subtractive mixing, if we mix all those colors, we're going to get black. But we never do because our pigments aren't, we, we're relying on pigments, that's all I can say. And I'll talk a little bit more about pigments later. But um, at this point, we can get really close to black, but we can't get it. So in commercial printing, they talk about CMYK printing. They've got a black pigment that they also use to get that final resolution. Um, Okay, this is really pixelated, but it was such a great image. Um, so we've already talked about Newton as the first real color theorist, and there are hundreds of them. And uh, the other one I wanted to talk about was Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And he was the German author that wrote Dr. Faust. And he also wrote a lot about color, and he has this really bad, big, fat book. It's about this thick. And every summer, I think I'm going to read it. And I started, and I get bored. But he, uh, and he actually thought he was going to be more famous for this book than for his uh, fiction. But in this book, he looked at color, and he was really upset because Newton was so scientific and really took the human being out of it. So Gage's book is more about what we see and how we see it and color psychology. And what he, uh, in the book itself, there's just little paragraphs about what you might see. And one of them was about colored shadows or what we see in clouds or whatever. And he sat there and observed and wrote down what, what you see in a shadow. Um, he then went on to make some justifications for those or rationales, which we've since proven wrong. But Gaty was so influential, you still see him cited in pieces and dissertations today. Uh, so this is his color wheel. And uh, this is actually Andy Warhol's image of Gertrude. Um, but very influential for the Impressionist, Surat, I wrote it down. Um, I guess I didn't write it down. Uh, because he talked about colored shadows, and they're not really black. They are usually the opposite of the color that you're using. So yellow might be purple, or uh, but because they're so dark and also weak in chroma, which we'll get to in a minute, they don't really look like a color. They, they sort of look like black, but when you study them, you realize they're not. So uh, much about the imp Impressionist is based on that. Also Seurat, maybe a little bit of others. Um, the other color theorist I'll talk about briefly is Albert Munsell, who was an American. And in the early 1900s, he created a color system uh, that had a color notation. And you could look at each one of these colors here, and they had separate notation for them. And the reason he did that, he realized that uh, manufacturing was worldwide, and you might send something off and say it was puce and no one knew what it meant, or everyone had a different idea of what it meant. And puce is actually kind of a dirty red, very common in the Victorian era. Um, but it had its own color number, <coughs> according to Mansell. And this is his color tree. And we talk about color systems now instead of color wheels. And all contemporary color systems are three-dimensional. And Munsell was probably the first one to actually write about that and give it names. Um, so this would be two facing pages in its color system. And he's actually got 10 color 
or five primary colors and five intermediate colors, which throws off our color mixing completely if you're an artist. But what's nice about it, it's easy to read. So uh, here, everything on the left is the hue, yellow, and yet a hue is the family name, like red, yellow, green, blue. And on the right is the opposite or complement in the Munsell system. We tend to think purple is the complement, but for Munsell, because he only had 10 colors, or five primaries, five intermediates, it threw everything off, so we don't have two complements. Um, so here's the family name. Value, which is the lightness or the darkness, uh, is the second dimension of color systems. And sometimes you read about that as luminosity or brightness, depending on what color system you're using. And then the third aspect, and value is always measured vertically. You always see that on color systems. And then the third one is the chroma, going from something that's really bright to something that's really gray. And usually I wear something that's really bright because oftentimes the projectors have a real hard time projecting my images of weak chroma or whatever, and I forgot, and then I looked in here and I thought, no, nothing. But the chairs are really strong in chroma. We're all wearing things that are kind of weak in chroma, that are mixed with other colors. So you think about strong chroma, straight out of the jar, straight out of the tube. You've got, yeah. But you know, you turn the lights off and everything looks like it's weak in chroma all the time. Um, so let's look here. So this is Joseph Albers, who was also a big color theorist. And we'll talk about him in a minute. Um, and he did that whole series, the homage to the square. This one's 1966. And they're all about 24, 27 inches in square. And what Albers was looking about was the relationships of colors and what they do to each other. But here you see orange. And on my monitor, that's a really strong kind of Halloween orange on the outside. Well, kind of like the back wall. Uh, and then it gradually gets weaker in chroma. So we think about uh, the hue here, orange, carries the expressive aspect, or also color sim symbolism. So um, orange is the color of danger. It's also it's supposed to be kind of brash, sometimes suggested cheap. You get all those things in orange. Uh, if you squint your eyes and look at this, you might be able to see the value changes, and they're really not in it here. What he's got is strong chrome on the outside, and then the weaker, a little bit yellower on the inside. Um, Matisse's Red Studio, I mean, another example of the color and if you, the hue carrying the expressive aspect, and if you can remember this, because it doesn't look that strong in chroma up here to me. But every projector does something different, and you can never anticipate. Some colors really come out beautifully, and other stone. Um, so here, red, passion, love, uh, festivity, um, and there's also bad associations with red. It used to be uh, the uh, anarchy, blood, um, I can't think of them right now, that the British used to always have their uh, uniforms for their soldiers as red because it would hide the presence of blood on the uniform and demoralize the troops. So it wasn't until after the Boer War, which really initiated guerrilla warfare, and they were targets out there in their bright red, strong chroma jackets, so then they changed the color of the uniform. Uh, and here you can see it in black and white. So uh, you see, do you see some value changes here that um, Value, the second dimension, carries most of the information in, the, in any artwork or design. Um, this is a pretty flat paint. Value usually suggests three-dimensional form or space, but Matisse's studio is really pretty flat because he's all, and that huge area of red is just one value and strong chroma of red. He does have a little bit of value changes that lead your eye through the picture playing this way. And value can do that. So even though we see a lot of things uh, you know, in the art history books, so much of it's in black and white, you still get a lot about what that image is doing. You may not get the expressive or symbolic aspect of the color. Um, but Georges de la Tour, uh, the cheat, is.